that should be back now. F5 it if, you, if you're not. But if you can't hear this, then you don't know to F5 it, do you? Uh, <laughs> I suppose not. Anyway, I typed in the chat. Yeah, I typed in the chat too. Okay, so personal story. Uh, I, I heard some, you know, we talked about earlier the Norn area had some criticisms. I liked what I saw of the personal, st of the human. I didn't, I purposely kind of didn't go too far. Uh, I might check out a different branch in, in the beginning and the next one to see how it changes. Uh, but let's move on to the last thing I wanted to talk about with regards to the PvE stuff. Crafting. Wait, is, I, oh, is sorry. the... Is, this, it, is this, it back? It's, I don't... Uh, I just refreshed it. Wait, I think it's coming back. Yeah, it looks like it's back to me. Video. Okay, we, I think we're back, yep. Okay. So, let's talk about crafting. What do you guys... Uh, did you guys do a lot of crafting at all? A little bit. I did absolutely none. <laughs> well then, this was a great well, panel to have to talk about crafting. Um, I played around with cooking, um, but that was it. I, 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 was, I played around with cooking too, actually. But I, it's I, actually really fun. Like I don't know, I I could spend hours just sitting there trying to get like little recipes and stuff. Like it's really cool how that works. Now. I really do like what they did with having the bank tab for all of your sort of general crafting uh, things that you're going to have a gazillion of anyway. And apparently it goes up to stacks of like 250. So you know, like 250 jute or 250, you know, copper ore or whatever it is. Now, I, it's, it is kind of annoying that I have to go to my bank, empty out my inventory of all the normal things that I have in there, and then fill up on crafting materials, and then go back to the crafting station and do all my crafting, and then go back to the bank and throw everything else back in there. You know, it, it would be nice if they either had the bank right next to the crafting station, or, you know, that would be a really good marketing opportunity, right? You just have a character that's like, I'll be your bank if you give me a little interest yeah, or something. Yeah, crafting in Divinity's Reach is horrible. However, of crafting in um, the Char City is a lot better because everything's in that one little kind of area. I just wish they'd let you access the that database, uh, not database, but like the storage, the special storage area in uh, in your crafting menu, so you wouldn't have to have those common items on you in order to uh, to, to 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 get them. Yeah, Kai, we got your camera froze here. I'm gonna hang up on you. Just call, just call, calling you right back. All right. Okay. If I recall correctly, um, isn't there like some golem banker thing you buy in the cash shop? There is that, some uh, kind of a golem banker, but it only works for five days. Well, and then I, you have I to buy it that, again. Yeah, I assume that if you really want it to be right next to you, you don't want to spend that, like you know, 20 <laughs> seconds clicking the waypoints. Yeah. You're going to buy some gems. And if you're crafting a lot, you could probably make the money to buy the gems pretty easily. Yeah, That's all right. True. So anybody have any other final thoughts on crafting or PvE in general? Anything we didn't cover? I think it's really fun. Everyone says Guild Wars 2 is a PvP game. I think the PvE is fine. I mean, um, the, just the dungeon a little bit. I don't know if, like, do you want to oh, talk about the dungeon I did want to talk about the dungeon. Did you guys both went on that? Kai and, and Edwin, right? Yeah. yeah tell me I, about I, the, I dungeon. the dungeon. No spoilers, it, but tell me what you felt. Was it challenging? Was the story engaging? What happened? It's unnecessarily difficult. As in, it's not like a fun, challenging difficult. I felt that they deliberately tried to make it really hard to be annoying. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna spoil the tactics or anything like that, but literally the last boss was me running in, one hitting it, getting <laughs> one shot, going to yeah. the waypoint, running in, one hitting him, getting one shot, waypoint. And that was literally how I spent the whole of the last fight. So it wasn't fun. I literally was just teleporting to a waypoint the whole fight to get one hit on him. And we eventually just you there, know, beat wait, him was down. There, was there a waypoint at the boss? Um, like a, a couple of seconds away, there's a waypoint. Oh, okay. Yeah, there were waypoints so all around then there was, a, there was enough of you up all the time that he didn't reset his health, basically. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, one person would stay alive and the rest of us would be waypointing. I just felt like if it's the point where you have to waypoint constantly, that's unnecessarily hard. The whole, you know, the combat was being broken because I was just going back and forth from a waypoint. I didn't feel like I got a fight. I felt like I was just teleporting the whole time. I, it wasn't fun at all, that dungeon for me. I had a very different experience, actually. Um, I mean, everyone in our group was 31 plus, except for one guy who was 30. So we were all at level four or scaled us okay. down to 30. But, you know, we, you know, you read the tooltip under the, name, the boss's name and it tells you the overall things he does, like, um, and so we kind of, we had a plan before we did it, and, like, there was, we never wiped, but there were moments where we just backed out, uh, like, I had to back out to change my weapons out a couple times because I knew I would have an issue if I didn't, um, and the last boss, he is, he's really strong, he takes forever to kill, but 
you just you keep dodging. Like I had all my dodge weapons ready, and I was just running yeah. around like. Level does really time. make a difference, I think, because other people I've spoken to said that they didn't have a problem at all. Even other elementalists said that they never got one shot. So I really think like you have to be like level thirty to go. I mean, I was level twenty-eight and I was getting one shot by trash mobs. You need the elite really badly. I hit rampage yeah, one. Yeah. Like all, well, we I, had... all my, all my freak out skills, and I was able to uh, stay in melee range of him, um, and I didn't die for like twenty seconds. Then I ran away. Oh, well, we had, um, out of five, we had three people without an elite skill, so I think that really made it hard for us. Ooh, we, that that was... sounds like it would make a big difference. I mean, Tornado. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Oh, tornado. We, had, we had three level 28s, a level 30, and a level 31, so I think, you know, you really do have to all have your elites to get this done. But, I mean, it was possible. It was just wasn't fun at all without elite skill. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so what did you feel about the, I mean, the, the whole story mode of the dungeon is what you guys were doing, right? So did that actually tell a good story? Was it engaging? Did it make you want, you know, was it more engaging, let's say, than a WoW instance? Did you know um, what was going on and why? I knew what was going on and it was like the perfect combination because you have the cinematic at the beginning, which everyone has seen, so there's no spoiler there, but, um, you know, you have that and then you have the NPCs kind of talking to you as you're going along. There's, and, you know, there is a good combination of like cutscenes and, you know, actual just storytelling, but I still think it was just kind of like irrelevant to me. I was just kind of like, it's, you know, unnecessary storytelling. I'm a bit cynical. Like, I just want to get to bosses <laughs> and kill it and get loot. Like, that's, I'm very much like that. So, I mean, it is a good mix between SWOTOR and WoW. Like, it's the perfect combination of story and combat, I mm. think. Like, it's an interesting story, and I'd, I'd love to watch the cinematics if uh, Wooden Potatoes put out one of those types of videos with those. But when, when you're in that dungeon, you want to do the fights. And the best thing yeah. is the NPCs that run with you, they talk a little bit when you're running around, and they have uh, text options you can choose if you miss something. And so for the most part... Um, I did not feel that read that uh, watching the cinematics during the actual fight or before the fights was important, mm. which there is a cinematic before each and every uh, boss battle. Did Did you find that the NPCs are actually useless? Like I thought, you know, everyone's gonna be like, my immersion, whatever. But these NPCs are meant to be legendary NPCs. They're meant to be like, you know, the heroes of Tyria. You know, you've got Ritlock. Like, come on, he's meant to be like a badass and. He was dead the whole time. Like, <laughs> I, I rezzed him more than I rezzed any of my party members. Like, and I just thought, like, okay, he doesn't have to do a ton of damage, but please just don't let him die unless we wipe, because it's just it just ruins the whole story of him just being dead on the floor the whole time. <laughs> That's true. true. Some, some my immersion. <laughs> yeah, come on. Like, Ritlock's dead on the floor. He was meant to, like, one-shot a dragon. Come on. He had a flaming sword for crying out loud. Yeah, I just thought it was silly. Like they should make it so that they literally can't die, like unless we wipe. I mean, I only he only died on the last fight for our group. Um, but for the most part, he just kind of stood around the back. That he wasn't neither of the <laughs> making NPCs snide really comments useful. about your. <laughs> That's not how you do it. <laughs> like I could totally <laughs> see it. Oh, they yeah. actually say though. They do actually say, "I need a little help here." When they're like downed, and I'm just like, "I'm dead." What do you want me to do? <laughs> you're legendary. Yeah, like, you're just him chucking rocks, and he's yelling at you like, I, oh, I'm, are a, you horrible? "I'm a beer level twenty-eight elementalist, and you're Ritlock. Like you're, uh, and you're <laughs> you, asking me for help." The, Come the, on. the destroyer of what? Three dragon champions. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he's like, oh, he's oh like, got downed you. by a Silvari. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and the most badass sounding strange. character in the game. <laughs> he is the most badass sounding character in the game. That, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, voice actor is fantastic. All right. I'd love to talk more about this. I think we're running out of time, though, here. So let's, let's take another very short break. It's going to be like a two-minute break or less. So don't go anywhere. We're going to get the next members on the show here. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
And welcome back, everybody. We are back today. We are, oh man, covering everything. And we're going to be talking about world versus world now with myself, Bridger. Talesofteria.com is the website in case you somehow have missed it after all this time. Uh, also joining me, free Freelancer, back again. Hello, sir. How's it going? Also, we have live from Stone Mist Castle, ladies and gentlemen, Oku Raku from Team Legacy. <laughs> welcome. That's, I'm just hanging out of stone mist. That's not cool, man. I want that. <laughs> no fair. My immersion. All right. Also joining us, we have Great. Welcome, sir. Hello there. Good to see you again. There we go. Move Glad that up. Back. Just a tad bit. All right. So let's talk world versus world. Guys, was it everything you hoped for? Does it live up to the hype? Let's put it that way. Great. Tell me. Um, I, I said last week I was not... I was planning to do structured PvP all weekend. I did not a single match of structured PvP over the whole weekend. I did world only world. world versus world. <laughs> wow, that's, that, that was it. I guess that's saying something right there. Yeah, freelancer. What did it? Did it meet all of your hopes and dreams? Uh, it did. Yep, it did. And I'm coming in blurry right now, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was super excited. Um, it it's it, it took a little getting getting used to. For a lot of the newer guys but it's especially coming down to that last little beta dreaming bay event uh you know remember of course I, yeah remember dreaming bay i mean it's <laughs> having that organization it was just so different to be able to do that so yeah it was uh, oku did it live up to the hype uh what do you think did it did, yeah, did you man, play uh, rvr were you from one of the people from the old uh dark age of camelot days yes dark age of camelot was my first mmo and I would say the only game that kind of compared to that was Planet Side, and you know we can talk about that at a different different time. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely, World vs. World lived up to the hype. I had a ton of fun. I mean, I I played World vs. World from the start to the finish, literally the minute the servers opened until the minute they closed. Um, did nothing but World vs. World, and I was like level eight, and I had two weapon skills unlocked. So <laughs> <laughs> now, that's how much I loved it. Now, did you uh, did you? find anything that surprised you was there anything whether it was pleasant or unpleasant was there something that was surprising like oh wow i didn't expect that in world versus world oh wow did i supply is like so rare like i don't want to say rare but it's life such blood. a like it's the lifeblood of world this world and i wasn't expecting it to be so like such a huge like pivotal resource in world this world i was not expecting it to be so rare as it was like we would go to supply camps and keeps and there'd be no supply and we're like well we have no supply what are we doing <laughs> well we can't take it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I guess, uh, you know, just coming from DOC, that was the primary difference. You know, there was no no mechanics similar to supply in DOC, and I would agree with great. Supply is pretty much all World this World is about. He who controls supply is the one who controls the siege, and he who controls the siege wins the battle. And that definitely adds to the whole thing, right? It gives you a real strategic macro layer to deal with that really grips you, and, and it's, it, it's more than just team PvP with walls. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, you know, we we pulled a strategy where we held off supply camps and choked them out. And that's definitely a strategy from like, uh, say, an RTS that we did in an MMO. I, I've always loved that. I mean, I was a big fan of natural selection, which took FPS sort of gameplay, but gave it the RTS resource system. And it's just it's it's really to it really is awesome to feel that resource system, especially it was great that you had to actually guard those caravans because you couldn't just bring a bunch of supply yourself and drop it off at a site. You, you, if you had supply on, you couldn't give it to a castle. And that kind of made it so you had to guard those supply caravans. Do you find that to be a good thing or a bad thing? Would you guys, like Freelancer, would you rather have your guys able to put supply back? Uh, yeah, yes and no, because I'm thinking in the, it would be, yeah, it'd be great if, TL could do that, but what I'm thinking is if you allow, <laughs> if only if the TL allow, guild could do it, well, nobody think about else. it. You know, we have a we have a keep, and all of a sudden, all these pugs run up and take our supply and put it in their keep. <laughs> I mean, talk about trolling. Oh, that's true. Um, you know, so that's that's what I'm thinking about. Um, yeah, it, it's it's one of those. If it could be controlled, great. If you can control who could take out of your keep, but if you allow people to take out of one keep and put it in another, you just have guilds siphoning off each other, just uh, you know, to do it. Um, it, they, it would have to be some way of, you know, monitoring that, I guess. All right. So we talked about uh, 
you know, the fact that it lived up to the hype, there must have been some things that were wrong with it. Was there anything systemic that you didn't like? Was the, the supply too slow, too fast? Was it just right? Was, was, was there anything, you know, the walls were too easy, too hard? What, what, was there anything that you didn't like about the systems of World versus World? Uh, uh, myself, uh, I really thought supply was too plentiful. Um, I mean, we, we had a lot of times where we're like, there's no supply, you know, what are we going to do? But that's how it should be. I mean, you shouldn't be able to just throw random waste resources. Oh, but, let's just throw a trebuchet down. Who cares? Then, yeah, exactly. So, you know, what's, what's the risk factor in placing that siege golem versus that ram? And having, I mean, there were times we were short on supply, and it was really surreal to be able to make that decision myself to say, is it better to put three rams on this wall or, or on this door or put a siege golem there and then escort them up? Now, you, we took into account our mesmers, you know, how many mesmers can we get the siege golem from this keep to this keep? We did, we did a lot of uh, little mathematics real quick, but um, having that, you know, having to make those decisions really added to the immersion of it, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it was really great. I think... I, if I had to say to tweak it one way or another and not keep it the way it was, I would actually like to see less supply because there were times when um, when keeps that nobody really cares. I'm sorry, not keeps, towers, when nobody cares about, had like you know 500 supply in them for no reason at all. Whereas there were keeps like stone mist that would never get supply, and it, it's I would just like to see less and less supply in the game. I would like it to be where if I place that catapult down or if I'm the random guy placing that. Uh, trebuchet down, it's, it means everything that I placed it down, you know. And, and maybe it was just because we were in such an organized guild that we had access to a lot more supply because we were able to make sure that, hey, everybody who's on TeamSpeak here, do you have supply? No. Okay, the people who don't go yeah. here get supply, come back. So if, in it, whereas if you're in a less organized sort of a Zerg situation, supply is going to be less plentiful by default because people aren't that organized. So yeah, we, maybe we were that able would... to assign our strip groups, you know, in, uh, in order to basically we aim towards particular objectives, objectives, not because of their point value, but because of the amount of supply they had in them. So when we sent out our scouts, you know, we had seven to eight scouts that were constantly keeping Whisper Tab with me. And they would judge the supply levels of different towers so that we could keep our raid going with the other guilds that we were with. So you uh, capture full, a tower and rape it of all supplies, and then you keep going. Yeah, we called it strip. We called it strip mining, and we we literally <laughs> would take particular. We would run all the way across the map to take a tower, just to strip it of resources, so we can come all the way back to take this keep with four rams on each on each door. I mean, we did that on purpose. That was how we took out keeps in less than ten minutes. And um, watching these other pugs that didn't have that sort of organization, it was really bad. I felt bad for them because. They would bash on a wall for like 30 minutes, and they thought that was bit having fun. You know, it was like PVD is what we called it, player versus door. <laughs> you know, and, and Team Legacy was not having that. So, you know, every door we came to, because we did the, the macro management of supply, we always put three to four rams on it. Um, the doors went down in under 20, 30 seconds. Um, we, we, we timed one at uh, 17 seconds, which was amazing. We were, like, all thrilled about it. Um, <laughs> But we couldn't have done that without having all that organization. And it worries me that these pugs running around, they don't have that way of organizing that. So they really do hit on the door for an hour straight. And they call that fun. They call that world be world. I'm sure there were some people in there that was going, ah, this is not for me. But they stuck there because, you know, they wanted to be the world versus world experience. But, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time. I said we're definitely going to see a lot less of let's throw fire at a door until it falls down. Uh, you know, the, but more people learn that, oh, well, we could sit here for an hour and do that, or I could take the 10 minute trip back there to buy a siege ram, and there's got to be somebody in this room, in this group with enough supply, and maybe I can convince them through local chat or team chat or something to do it. Uh, yes. Definitely, definitely love, uh, love the way that that all went down. Somebody had a good yeah. question in here. I'm trying to remember what the hell it was. Um, it, the question about uh, points that you could teleport to. And basically, for example, in the Eternal Battlegrounds, um, you have the, the four keeps, Stone Mist plus the three keeps that everybody has in their sort of starting areas there. And keeps are the only things that can be upgraded with a waypoint that you can teleport to. Now, anytime a keep seems to be under attack, I think anytime a door takes any damage, or maybe guards, I don't know what it is exactly, that keeps teleportation point goes down and nobody in the team can't use it anymore. I think that's super important because if the defenders could just instantly could die and then 
instantly spawn back into the middle of the map in Stone Mist, it would be basically impossible to take this, the, the thing against, you know, more than 10 defenders. But... Somebody says it takes, you know, too long to run all the way around. Uh, I mean, Oku, what do you think about the, the way that you have to spawn way over here and, and, and make your way to where you're going? How did that feel? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty much exactly what you said. You can't have the waypoint inside. And I think that actually having that distance is a critical component of the way World of the World works. You have to have some time where you can attack the keep, with, you know, let me see, how do I say this? You don't want to have people where people can get in there instantly to defend because even if you didn't have the waypoint inside the keep, you'd have a problem where people were spawning and coming back immediately. Um, you know, if, the, if there was another waypoint nearby. And that's just not really that fun. You want to be able to sort of hold out and, you know, have that feeling of if I die inside this keep, I'm not getting back. I have to do whatever I can to survive. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I love... <laughs> <laughs> I think this is if this is what I think it is. Somebody pointed out, um, yes, indeed. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this in here because I think it's completely <laughs> completely applicable. This is uh, a video that shows the most dangerous enemy in World vs. World. Oh, no. Let's watch oh, no. it here. Take a moment. I'll put a link to this in the show notes. Oh, it's a very got the warrior leading his guild or or group of PvP. Here we go. Follow me, guys. Wait, wait for it. You gotta put it on screen, Bridger. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't put it on screen. <laughs> Thank you for telling me. <laughs> let me. Let me put it on screen and it'll, it'll make a lot more sense here. And, and let me turn the damn music off. Wow, okay. It's getting late. I'm failing all over the place. But here, let's watch this and actually get, get an idea of what's going on. You got the, you got the warrior leading his, his guild here. Follow me, guys. Ouch. <laughs> One person made it. Dead, dead. Wait, wait. Dead, 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 dead. Wait for it. <laughs> dead, dead, dead. <laughs> like lambs to the slaughter. Dead, dead. You can see all the dead people. And they just keep going. <laughs> oh, man. I, uh, so I know that uh, Freelancer Team Legacy had a bit of trouble with cliffs. At the beginning. Oh yeah, we did. Uh, we we had a running joke that because we were doing pretty well like against other groups, and we had a running joke uh, that the only way we were our, our largest source of death was the cliff boss, and uh, it, it was like an epic you know epic raid PVE raid is beating that cliff boss because if you were in the Borderlands you'd understand okay it was like every every direct route if you wanted to take the bird's eye you know the bird line to each keep, you had to scale these giant cliffs. And uh, it was just bad all around. And we, we would navigate them, and I was trying to teach the DL guys, and they got it for the most part, on how to scale down a cliff the proper way without dying. But the the pugs following us, man, they dove off like Superman. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it always I believe felt, it always felt I can up. fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, because they see us down there, and they're like, oh, I guess they survived. I can do it, too. But little did they know that we, you know, we would straight into the wall as we're falling so that we don't take full fall damage. And, yeah, they didn't do the Yeah, thing. I seem to they remember a certain Mesmer placing a portal at the bottom of a cliff so that the people who jumped <laughs> off legitimately would go into the portal and then appear at the top of the cliff and then immediately fall off because they were still holding W and they're dying. You know anything about that, Freelancer? That's, I remember that know, happening. That guy, who, who, who did I be? <laughs> oh, uh, Bridger, one thing we were able to find out, okay, was that if I place a portal on the bottom and you don't, and you jump into that portal from the top of a super high cliff, you will actually hit the portal and teleport up safely. Oh, and that, that before you take the fall so, damage. That's thinking with portals, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so what we, what we ended up doing is taking uh, the portal entrance and exit and putting it right next to each other on the bottom so that you were bound to hit it when you jump down. And ah. I could have the, the guys that were following me jump from a cliff that would normally insta-kill them, hit the portal, and then appear on the portal right next to it and <laughs> be perfectly safe. It was pretty neat. That sounds awesome. 
Uh, I, I did, I do really like, though, how vertical space really plays a huge part in World vs. World. And there are very, you get to know the maps, and there are places, like we saw in that video right there, where if you have one of those movement abilities, or, or, or one of the swiftness abilities on, you can make the leap where you otherwise wouldn't normally be able to make. And knowing where those are to cross from one area to the next really fast, I accidentally found one of those places. Like, I, I was just, you know, trying to get to where the guild was meeting up, or something to that effect, and I had happened to turn on one of my speed boosts right before I hit the cliff edge. And it looked like it was just a drop, you know, five feet. But there was actually a chasm between, you know, <laughs> me and that five foot drop. And I just barely jumped at the last second with swiftness on. And I just barely landed on the other side. And I didn't know there was a chasm there till I got there. And that was like, I was like, whoa, mind equals blown. That was great. I am badass. <laughs> but man, it would have been really, really embarrassing to have not made that jump. Uh, anyway... <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so yeah, definitely, definitely loving the environment of World versus World. What do you guys prefer to fight on? The Eternal Battlegrounds or the Borderlands? Great. I thought that the Borderlands are probably going to be where a lot more of the guilds focus their attention. And I felt that was where more of the coordinated groups were because the EB was full. Like the Eternal Battlegrounds, the main area was full. Because that's the only way you could get there. If, if you didn't know what you were doing, you could only enter the Eternal Battlegrounds. If you didn't know that Lion's Arch existed... You had to go to the Eternal Battlegrounds first. That's why all the noobs were there. <laughs> well, not only that, but, like, Bridger, you want to go see World vs. World in the beta weekend. You're going to go to, like, all oh, the central map has to have all the cool stuff. It does and have there the was biggest crazy castle. Stuff. Yeah, it has the biggest castle. And everyone, I guess, got focused there. And so that was always locked. And it's, But I felt like a lot of our cooler, more fun moments were on the, the Borderlands, which I did not expect to happen at all. I thought everything would be in the Eternal Battlegrounds. Oku, what did yeah. you think? Eternal Battlegrounds or Borderlands? Um, I, I guess I would have to say, and you know, of course I'm total fanboy here, but I would have to say I love both maps. Um, I think that each one is different, is good in a different way. The keeps in the Borderlands I feel like are a lot harder to take, and I think that's because of the orbs. Um, anyone who played DOC knows that relic raids were pretty much the most challenging thing in the entire game. And uh, I think that you know, what we saw in the beta wasn't really necessarily that, except for, of course, Dreaming Bay. Um, but I think what you'll see on release is that when there's a two-week battle uh, and money, money becomes less of an issue, more guilds will spend all their money and supply to upgrade every keep. And so those Borderlands keeps will actually be like super fortresses. Um, whereas Especially then again the, the one that holds that orb. Yeah, because that yeah. makes a pretty big difference. At one point, Team Legacy, our server had 15% uh, had more HP because we had all three Borderlands orbs. And, yeah, exactly. and that makes those specific keeps way more valuable than, you know, any other keep on the map because that extra 5% could mean the difference between, you know, getting out of the arrow fire and managing to get your heal off and not. Right. And, and that, that uh, health buff, buff actually applies to NPCs as well. So, you know, guards may not oh, be a big deal. Oh, I didn't deal, know but... that. Yeah, so but it applies to like the keep lords, and so it could add maybe 5 to 10 seconds on a keep lord kill, and, you know, depending on the timing, that could actually be a game breaker. So was there the guild sort of claim system built into the game yet, or is that still something we're waiting on? Uh, well, we ended up in the first day when we tried, because we took Stone Mist in all three uh, rounds that we got in. In the first day, we couldn't claim anything. It, it just, for some reason, it wasn't working. Now, magically, through the first day, I think it was Oku, uh, or it, if it wasn't you, Oku, it was somebody, it was like, we can claim. Like, he got the option to claim. Mm -hmm. So we tried claiming, and nothing happened. Well, at this point, we had just unlocked our guild banner and our logo and all this stuff. So I was just like, oh, what the heck? Let me just go try on the, on the second day to claim. And we, we had Stone Mist, so I ran up. How, and, how do you claim it, by the way? Well, when, you when your Keep Lord spawns after you kill the enemy Keep Lord, uh, you talk to him, and it's just the option of appears there. Would you like to claim this for your, for your guild? And normally, when we were clicking it, nothing would happen. You know, we had our logo. And, uh, but for some reason, the second day, it started working. So we had our, our colors flying at Stone Mist from then, thenceforth. And you can see it behind uh, Oku there. Uh, our little logo and stuff, but uh, it it was kind of buggy. I mean, but I felt underwhelmed because it, for one, and I mean, I guess I'm used to Warhammer. When we were leading our guild in Warhammer, uh, when you claimed to keep, when somebody pressed the letter M and they looked at the mini map, uh, they would see the the guilds that owned it. You know, right? Oh, so that would be cool. Yeah, it, and that was just that's just normal for me. I'm used to seeing that. So when I pressed M to see if there's anything special about claiming claiming this keep at all. There wasn't, and you know it's it's trivial, but uh, there's no upkeep related to it. There's no benefits of holding it. There's 
it seemed like it was completely pointless to claim it because the only thing that happened was your little flag showing. And you got to imagine that half the server, if not more, has no idea whose flag that is anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, really, what's the point of claiming it all? Well, that's, once that's you claimed right it, now. can't you then apply the influence bonuses and, and other things that uh, you have in your guild, inf the things that you purchase with guild influence to the keep? Absolutely. But then at that point, you have to ask yourself, if I am, if my entire guild is working in this borderland, but I really want to claim Stone Mist, should I mean because you know it's Stone Mist and we did all the work and we took it out and we claimed it. What's the point of applying the buffs if they're going to appear in Stone Mist when we're working over here? You know. Well, I it's, think it does work for all allies and not just for guild members. So it would certainly help your allies in that, hold in that Stone Mist. Area, though, yeah, in the know? in the area around Stone Mist. So true. if we're blowing the the buffs, for example, if we claim Stone Mist. And we're in the borderlands. What good does that do us? Right. In addition, claiming the keep doesn't give you exclusive control over the keep's upgrades. Anybody who has the gold can go up and say, I'm ordering this upgrade. Spend the supply that's in the keep's <laughs> Absolutely. Gold. And it was driving me insane, the <laughs> random pugs that would come up to Stone Mist as we're trying to escort supply and get it beefed up so that, you know, Reddit and them couldn't immediately take it. When random pugs would run up and upgrade the guards, like... Oh, it was such a facepalm moment when I had come back to do my upgrade rounds because I would run all around the map and just blow money on upgrades. And you were trying to reinforce the doors and 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 get yeah, cannons absolutely. on it, it's and they'd just... upgrade the guards instead. And you're like, no. And it was just it was so mind boggling that you know if anybody's going to take stone mist, they're going to come with forty people. Okay, I don't. What difference does it make if the guards now are now level 81 or 82 if 40 people are 40 people, <laughs> you know? And it doesn't make, yeah. it doesn't change anything. Now, I can understand if it's a smaller little ragtag guild that, you know, is trying to do a little ninja capture. Overnight then the guards or something, yeah. off, But that never happened, okay? Because any small group of players that thought they were going to be cute and try to ninja the one of the doors got bombarded by cannons and mortar fire. So it just drove me insane. But... The upgrades are so important, Bridger. Uh, we realized halfway through that we were thinking about it all wrong. It was because we are, we had the offense down. You know, we were taking keep, keep, had no problem wiping out groups larger than us. We had our little AOE squads, no issue. But what we realized is that when you come up against a reinforced door, everything changes, you know, and uh, all, everybody watching the stream, you know what I'm talking about. If you went up against a reinforced keep, you could not use any of the tactics that you used on the other games. It was an entirely different ball game. So that got us to thinking that instead of uh, just, you know, going around point to point taking and splitting and taking towers, uh, we should actually just take one point at a time and then reinforce it as we go along at a much slower approach because of the amount of time it would take to take it back. Well, by that point, Reddit had already caught on to us. And so <laughs> the rest is history. But uh, it, there's a lot of learning done, uh, and we had a blast doing it. Oh, there's so much more I want to talk about, but I also want to talk about structured PvP. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, you know what, we got to talk about everything. That, I said we're going to talk about everything, we're going to talk about everything. Uh, final thoughts here about World versus World uh, before we go. Did anybody, do we miss something? Is there something else we wanted to talk about here? Oh, you know what? The max people on screen was bugging the hell out of us, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the clipping. Oh, yeah. There was, there was yeah, some... Yeah max number of people and it seemed to be about 25 or 30 that you could have on screen at any moment which means sometimes people were clipping in and out there were freelancers like follow me we're like where are you we can't yeah. see you and he's like what do you mean yeah. you can't see me oh there you are oh you disappeared yeah. you're gone now because there's too many people on my screen we're hoping that that is simply a thing that they, a, a limit that they've imposed because the game isn't optimized and that'll go way up because there was a point at which i, I was standing at the top of uh, uh some stairs you know, waiting for this group of enemies to come up. And, you know, a couple started, I was like, oh, okay, there's five guys here. And then, you know, some of the TL, I, I kind of backed out of my view. And suddenly I was like, oh, no, wait a minute, there's 15, there's 20 here. Oh, my God, I can't yeah. tell. We, uh, we started uh, taking advantage of that bridge. I don't think, maybe you were there towards that last Streaming Bay raid, and we did it a few times there. But throughout the day, we realized that when you get about, uh, we counted it, me and a couple of officers counted it at about 40 uh, entities. So that could be mobs near you. That could be players. That could be any any like ranger pets. Grr. Exactly. So forty yep. entities. So if we had about thirty to forty people in the in our little TL raid, and we had different raids, you know, in different maps, and we had forty people, we could assume that if we ran at an enemy, they for the most part would not see us. So what we started doing is taking advantage of that. We sent uh, submit. We submitted bug tickets and everything for it. 
But we would place a portal, okay? Again, thinking with portals, but it works so beautifully. Um, place a portal, and then in the middle of an enemy group that was like 60 to 70 people, like there, we did it to the credit numerous times, um, where they had twice our numbers, we would place the, I would run in, they'd see me. So, oh, it's just a mesmer, you know, what can he possibly do to our, you know, 80 man Zerg here, right? You know, I come in with my portal, uh, place the exit portal right in the middle of them. And then TL would know that when they poured in, they're not going to see anybody because everybody's clipping. But when they go in, they're oh, throwing Oh, because you're already their seeing AOVs all out. of your own teammates and won't exactly. show anything new that enters. That's right. exactly right. So what happened is we poured in, we mass AOE everything with half their numbers. It was beautiful. It, it was, it was <laughs> abusing the clip. It's so, not abuse. It's, it's, it's a the, beta. These are the things you're supposed to figure out, right? The local chat went up in rage. They were like, what the <laughs> heck just killed us? Because <laughs> all they see, you got to imagine, all they see is a spell effect of a Mesmer portal down. And they, they don't see the, you know, anything else. They just see everybody dying around them. You know, <laughs> they have no idea what's going on. They're, they're justifiably frustrated. We're not, we're not saying this is the way it should be. Oh, any actually, account. every one of us, I, I told everybody, you know, this is why, why they need to fix it. And um, I hope they do fix it because that yeah. could just as easily be turned around on us and vice versa. You should be able to see enemy players at the very, very least. Somebody gave the suggestion that you could turn on enemy nameplates and that made a difference. It didn't. So, yeah, I just, um, yeah. I can actually comment on that, you know, because this <clears throat> this issue was a pretty big deal for myself. I was uh, manning an arrow cart, which, you know, arrow carts, all the siege weapons are awesome. But, you know, one of the things you're doing with arrow carts is you're laying down sort of a kill zone of, uh, you know, you can't go in here. And if you can't see where they are, you know, you can't really, you have to lead them a little bit, right? Um, and so I did that nameplate thing. But what I actually saw was that while player names didn't show up, pet names actually would. And so... <laughs> Yeah, I could, I could see so the pets coming. So you killed a lot of rangers, but not a lot yeah. of other classes. Yeah, exactly. So, like, if you see a ranger, stay away from them, because that's where the air carts are going. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I noticed is that the, you know, none of the siege weapons showed up properly as far as uh, red circles. You know, everything was white, whether it was friendly or enemy. You'd see the circles on the ground, they were all white. It was really, really impossible to know which of those circles was friendly and which was enemy. You just kind of had to roll all the time dodge because there was no way to figure it out. And that was really frustrating to me is, is basically none. And I actually didn't see any player-based circles uh, do it. I saw... Uh, PVE, like enemy mobs, when the boss put down a big thing, he would put down a red circle. But every player circle I ever saw was white, and that was really frustrating. I really thought that we'd be seeing a lot more red circles so you'd know exactly what is damaging and what isn't. Because when you see a meteor shower coming down, you have no idea if that's friendly or enemy. There's no indication. You can't get, you don't know whether you should get out of the way or not. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it pretty much just becomes you see a circle, you get out of it. <laughs> we we exactly. learned a lot of things quickly. We learned, uh, I know Oku is a big part of that. We, we're out, if we come up against enemy doors and such, and can't really give out any too, too much details, but there's specific counters to specific defenses. Once we got those down pat, there was nothing stopping us. I mean, reinforced keeps, et cetera. Even mass error parts. God, the, the headache I got for a solid 24 hours for mass error parts. Mm -hmm. um, they are just so powerful when bunched up. Alone, three of them at a time, not a big deal. When you get uh, the arena net guy, I'll tell you right now, Izzy, I'm looking right at you because you know you're guilty. <laughs> All right, Izzy's, Izzy's cute little idea was, let's go ahead and place eight of these carts right around the keep lord. And so when TL runs into this keep, we're just going to mass AOE, you know, these arrow carts down. Well, thankfully, we saw it coming. Okay, so, you know, we have our, our little trick that we use to get behind the arrow cart with the portal, and that's it's going to be common knowledge at this point, but... When we, when he realized he couldn't do that to us, that's when he, you know, complimented us. But mass arrow carts to any group that doesn't have a way past it, there's no stopping it because he placed it right behind the keep walls. You can't hit it with catapults, can't hit it with trebuchet, and they, you could spam the heck out of them. I mean, they fire so fast. I felt uh, catapults. I mean, Oku, what do you think about catapults? A little underwhelming, right? Yeah, I mean, we didn't really use catapults that much. I mean, we learned um, pretty quickly that the catapults don't do as much damage to a gate, obviously, as a ram. And so catapults are kind of there for, I think, anti-siege and then against walls. And uh, in the experience I had, um, which was all weekend, um, I only saw catapults in two attacks. And those attacks, we decided to attack the walls because of the configuration of the keep. Um, but they cost so much more. It's just, it's a little yeah. bit, yeah, I mean, I think that catapults will, will have their day uh, what are later. What when... for, by the way? 
Well, let's say uh, we're, we were using them pretty frequently, but let's say we're our bread and butter, because here's the key thing. Uh, the tooltip of Ballista say that it uses only 20 supply, so supply. It doesn't. It uses 30. So that was a little misleading, but we got that right away. So uh, you have a uh, basically something that shoots a 16K damage at siege weapons, uh, weapon. So you could throw it down in the back line. We had a pretty set way of doing it where we would target the oil, et cetera, with these. But they are so powerful. And you could also place them in doorways. Uh, there was a couple times we came across defenses behind doors where we place defenses behind doors, and the bolt goes through things. There was a bug also where you can target, uh, I believe it was friendly pets or something, and the, the arrow would actually go through the friendly person or the friendly object, not hit them, obviously, but then go through any any terrain or door behind them and hit the enemies behind it. Huh. So there's oh, wow. a little bugs, little bugs there we su submitted, but um, by far of all of the weapons, I mean, even besides trebuchet i would much rather uh just enough supply for like two or three ballistae than a trebuchet or rams any day of the week they just have so many uses you can use them in open world well, in the, battle the, only, field, the, the thing you know. for the trebuchet and the ram or the trebuchet and the and the catapult specifically is those are to be used on walls whereas pretty much everything else can be used on doors but i'm pretty sure that the only thing that affects walls are trebuchets and catapults right you can't do it with arrow carts you can't do it ballista you can't do it with right. rams <clears throat> yep. that's correct yeah, and I, mean, I think uh, the, another really cool thing about the ballista is that they can turn instantaneously, um, and they don't have a minimum oh. range. <laughs> oh, man. So if yeah, coming up on turn. you, you drop it we on We have yourself. screenshots of warriors rushing up to our ballista behind us. So we got the, the main PL raid up front. They're separated. They're, they're doing their thing. We got our ballista covering our flanks, and we had warriors just come up to the ballista, you know, from the other side or the other server, and the ballista doing an immediate 180 and just blowing them to pieces. <laughs> and it, it was like it, we took screenshots and everything. They have no turn, like um, there's no time for them to turn around. And, stuff. and it's got two other buttons you could change it to, like the four and five skills. You could change that to turn. I mean, I could see them simply adding a situation where it has like a 150 degree radius that you can fire in, and then it turns more slowly, so you can change the radius any way you want. But it takes a while to do it. I would like to see that sort of as a balancing factor uh, for those the easy shot thing. One. I remember getting chewed out by Oku, Great, and others for placing trebuchets the opposite direction by accident. <laughs> uh, <laughs> those take forever. <laughs> those take forever to turn around. So it was two very black and white scenarios. And it was but, really yeah. cool to be able to have like to, to like put the 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 trebuchets or the catapult or something like back and like spot for them. So you can put it, make them safe. And I think Reddit was using that against us as well. They had trebuchets sort of in or around the keep, and, and they were trying to take out our siege equipment, which was on the walls. I don't and, know if you were there for it, Bridger. We had that one attack at the garrison at Red World where uh, I forget which guild it was. I think it was uh, SOA or somebody. They, they had the trebuchet behind the keep lord. And so when we ran in, we, oh, yeah. I just think we, were, ex we were expecting arrow carts. That's fine. You know, we have our way to <laughs> But there was two catapults and a trebuchet in the back of this room. Okay. <laughs> it was so troll. It, it was, yeah, we went in there and got annihilated. And we're all just kind of scratching our heads. We're like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> Well, you, you know, remember, that was, uh, <laughs> that was the gate that you could actually see through. So we started to break that gate, and we could see through, and we're like, what, what is that inside there next to the keyboard? Is that you a should trebuchet? not be able to place a trebuchet behind the keyboard. That was such a <laughs> troll thing to do. They got us the first time. I mean, sec second time, we're like, okay, let's, you know, we had our way of dealing with it. But it was, the first time, we, we all insta-died, and we we're like, what just happened? <laughs> Somebody else, uh, Hegris says, don't forget that Trebs have a timer before they just despawn completely. So you spend all that gold on a trebuchet design, and it just disappears if nobody yeah, puts we, any supply uh, into we it. We had uh, the prolonged first siege on Dreaming Bay early in the lunchtime period against Reddit. Uh, we had four trebuchets hiding on this little cliff side, and they couldn't touch us. It was across the water, and we had our water skill set up. And uh, our turrets mounted right in front of the, the trebuchets. But what we realized is after sieging for... It was like 30 minutes, and we were having a blast. The trebuchet started despawning, and we're like, what's going on? And, and we have ran, uh, random guild members like, my trebuchet just disappeared. Well, did it get destroyed? No, it just disappeared. <laughs> so in the order was, in which uh, they were created, it turns out. So I'm not sure why that It's like, happened, sorry, but... the server only has 100 trebuchets to go around at a time. We have to give this to somebody else on the Eternal Battlegrounds. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, man, there's so much more, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about World vs. World experiences last week, because that is our question of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Tell us your World vs. World awesome experience. Feedback at TalesOfTeria.com. And if you think that we missed anything in any of these discussions, because we have been trying to move along and talk about everything while it's fresh in our mind, please send it to us. Feedback at TalesOfTeria.com. I do have to insist that we've got to move on and talk a little bit about structured PvP at the very least. So we're going to take another very short break and jump right back in here. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are back, and it is time to get to the moment you've all been waiting for, structured PvP discussion. Joining me for this one, we've got Freelancer back again, as well as Vega. Welcome, guys. Hello. And for the first time ever, we got Miane from Team Legacy, who wrote up a very nice uh, sort of review of structured PvP on the Team Legacy uh, uh, website, teamlegacy.net, in the forums there. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on today, because you had, uh, what did you call it, the first beta weekend event state of the game structured PvP style. Uh, so you had a lot of good thoughts. Sagasu put a lot of good thoughts in that thread. If you guys enjoyed structured PvP or want to talk about it, I highly recommend you check out that thread. Lots of good stuff. So Miane, uh, you had uh, some good things, some bad things to say about it. What was your overall impression? Did you, did it did it basically get to where you expected it to be? Uh, not really. And I feel this is uh, something everyone that's looking at competitive play on Guild Wars 2 felt through this beta weekend. Um, a structured PvP didn't feel a structure at all. It basically <laughs> was the feeling that you get when you join a Counter-Strike uh, game, and it's a public game, and you're, like, whatever you do, it does not matter. It has no weight whatsoever. Um, Even if I headshot all of the other guys? <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of felt like I mattered sometimes, because, uh, you know, when I snuck around and captured a, a, a point, or when I took down... Svanir, or uh, what was the chieftain guy on the forest map? Uh, but I, I could definitely see what you're saying. It's because I think part of that is because it was eight v eights this weekend instead of five v fives, right? Yeah, that was also really disappointing. Uh, basically, you could only join uh, from this list of servers that you have in this NPC that was called the server browser. Um, <laughs> That's a badass name for yeah. NPC, by the way. 
I know, indeed. Uh, it was only 8v8 available. You couldn't switch teams once you were inside. So all you, if you wanted to queue up with, let's say, your team of five or eight people even, um, you couldn't just switch around and try to go with them on the same team. So it was really disappointing what they show us for this better weekend. All right, uh, Freelancer, you played a little bit of beta uh, of the structured PvP. How did you feel? Did you, are your thoughts sort of the same? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I centered on the Mesmer, if that means anything. <laughs> uh, um, no, but, uh, yeah, I played, uh, I streamed it dur during, uh, in between our World v. World events. We had, like, breaks and stuff. And it's not any different, I mean, than what I expected. It's, it's structured PvP. I was a little disappointed that while I was playing, there was so much lag, but it's beta, so, you know, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, that's uh, something I definitely noticed, especially on all the two skills for the elementalist on the on the dagger dagger that I had. All of those are sort of like short range burst skills for the most part, and I missed so many of them because I'd activate the skill and then you know a second and a half later it would say miss, and it's like, well, they were right in front of me a second and a half ago. Uh, so hopefully, like we talked about earlier, that's going to get fixed in the future. Yeah, I mean my particular mesmer build worked out fine. Um, I didn't have any trouble. I didn't feel like any class was super overpowered and stuff. I had a very much a glass cannon build, and that's that's how it was. If I got caught, I was dead. But if I got if I caught somebody else, they were dead. So, um, you know, that's that's how I play my characters. That's how I've always played MMOs. I played a rogue in WoW. I played Talon in League of Legends. I mean, everybody knows. So, um, I felt like the Mesmer was was just as equal as anybody else. There's a lot of people complaining about Rangers. Mm -hmm. um, Rangers did have the upper hand against most classes. I, I noticed that, uh, but again, in my personal experience, if I caught a, if I saw a ranger and it was just me and a ranger in a wild west scene, you know, uh, that ranger was going down. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. The problem uh, I had is, is I kept targeting their pets by accident. Like I was trying to tab target them, and I'd wind up targeting the pets yeah. or something because it was tough to click them with the with the lag and such and. Uh, that that's kind of the advantage that rangers had over me. I'd keep targeting the pets and go, oh, I just used you know a, a skill on a pet by accident that I didn't want to do. So uh, I don't know, Vega. What did you feel about the structured PvP? Anything surprise you? Anything stand out? Um, well, I mean the the whole delay and the lag, which is to be expected. Um, I, I played engineer pretty much the whole time, and the one build, the, the build I started out with is I was using the pistols, the flamethrower, the grenades, and the big bomb, and um, so the pistols, the grenades, and the bomb, they all have, they're sort of like AOE stun is all, you know, it's, it's a, the ground targetable. So like you were saying, when you have that sort of delay in that lag in there, it makes it very difficult to trap someone when you, you normally would trap them. Um, and then, be, you know, from an engineer's perspective, a lot of the times you want to, or at least what I found in that particular build is that, you want to get them contained somewhere so that you could, you know, maybe drop a grenade on them or then drop a bomb on them and then him with your flamethrower. And when you have that delay in there, it makes it difficult to do that. Um, but I mean, it, you know, it, it was beta. Um, but overall, I, I thought it was it was fun. I could see the potential in it. That's for sure. I could see the potential in it, um, both positively and negatively. But, you know, there are some games that when the team was actually just kind of moving together and working as a team that you could see was being a lot more effective and that we were that the um the score was just very much in our favor because we were holding all the points or denying them points. But then there was other times where I was on teams that they just weren't they just weren't working together. And then there was one game, it was uh it was a guardian and a warrior. And it was two guys that were clearly playing together because I was literally perma stunned the entire time as they just stomped on me. I just felt like they tripped me on the ground, just stomped on my face and killed me, and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the negatives is that, uh, you know, as the game progresses, people are going to find those little builds and combos that there's very little you can do to get out of it. Um, and I think that just goes for any game, that there's just very good combos no matter what. It's just you have to eventually find a way around them. Gotcha. All right, Miane, what was your favorite uh, map between the two that we had, the Forest of Niflhel or uh, Battle of Kylo? I will say, hands down, the Forest map. Um, it just has a much greater feeling to it uh, from both a player and a spectator point of view. Um, I love the whole mechanic that, yes, you do have a way to come back into the game 
other than just capturing the points, which is, uh, you know, the chieftain and the mm -hmm. bear itself. Um, however, you, you can't really tell um, how the the flow of it is going to go because it, it was eight versus eight. So we ran into issues such as uh, people sending one or two just to kill those bosses. And there will be basically no risk on sending just two people and then having others just hold back at the points. There was just no feel that, hey, you're going to go take this 50 points and this really good boost for yourself and the team. Like, there should be some kind of risk that you well, take I, in there. I, I think the only risk that I could think of is it's kind of like, you know, Baron or Dragon in League of Legends is they could come in and steal the last hit on you if you're not paying attention. And, or they could come and, you know, kill you while you're fighting it and then take the last hit for themselves. But in order for that to happen, they have to be there at the right moment. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's not like in, you know, in League of Legends that, that system works a lot better because you can have vision and react when you see them. But with only five people and no way to put down a ward of any kind, it's impossible to know if they're going after, you know, Svenar or the Chieftain or what have you. But I, I, I did like the, the feel of the difficulty with one and two people. I, it's just difficult to get that same feeling. There's another thing about this. Um, in League of Legends, you know, you cannot take Dragon as soon as he spawns because you're going to be around certain level and... Um, the difference between you staying alive and actually killing the monster fast enough is going to be big. Like, there's a higher chance of, hey, the opposite team is going to come and they're going to destroy us. But um, in here, you went with two people and you could drop any of those two monsters really quickly, depending on your spec. I even saw Mesmer's uh, turn them into Moas and <laughs> completely <laughs> destroying them right away. I kind of just thought of something. I mean, you, you bring up a very good point in that you never know when the other an other team is going to have enough power to go after Dragon or, or Baron in League of Legends. Um, Freelancer, what do you think about a system where when the thing spawns, it spawns at like level 85 or something, something that would take like five people to take it down, but then every minute it drops down a level and becomes easier. So you would then have to decide, do we go after that guy right now with more of our team or do we chance letting the enemy have it and instead try to go after it later with less of our team or, or lower challenge. Does that system sound like it would fix the problem that Miani is bringing up? Uh, no, I don't think so because it's forcing everybody to go at a particular time. Um, you, if, if you have a spawn at level 80 and you know that at level 80 it's going to take your entire team to go there, nobody in structure PvP is going to take their entire team to go kill right. that because then you just lose all points. Um, so you're forcing everybody to wait till it is Oh, okay, yeah, maybe that's a bad example. So maybe more like yeah. it takes three people to, uh, when it first spawns and then brings it down. Um, but uh, do well, you think it should be so? Balance, let's let's yeah. ask you this a question. Should it be soloable? Well, I soloed it. I mean, I know. It, should it, it be? Is that is it, it be, a problem that it's soloable? I don't think you'll be able to stop it. I mean, the the mesmers have so many. Like I was telling you, the mesmers focus on all these kind of tricks up their sleeve. You know, uh, I was able to portal and blink. You know, nonstop and. You know, it didn't matter whether it had, you know, 100k more health or not. It was going down. I wasn't taking any damage. Gotcha. Um, it should it be so level? I mean, no, it shouldn't be. It should have some sort of snare that maybe roots the guy it's going after or something. Um, that would make a little bit of a change there. So I, I think it should be a team effort. I mean, why not, you know? I, I disagree. I kind of like that because, I, I mean, we're all, we keep on comparing this to League of Legends or Dota or whatever, and... You know, those games are 45-minute games, and that boss that you kill, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a big boost that you get, and, you know, it's gold, and it's an item in Dota, or it's a big buff in League of Legends, and it's a much more substantial investment that you're, that you're going for. The buff in, in, uh, in Guild Wars, it's, you know, it's a 30-second buff, you know, giving you power, whatever it gives you, um, and I don't think that it's that game changing it's a it's a well, nice buff but i don't think it's going to be that it's not like in a game where oh no they got dragon now they could do this huge push and win i don't well, think yeah, it's, but it's one I don't think tenth it's on that of the level. possible points if you get it yeah, twice it is 50 points if you get it twice you're one fifth of the way towards winning i mean that that's the difference but i mean you could hold you know two points the entire game if the enemy kills those 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 bosses you know two or three times if they get one of those kills they could pull ahead and win the game uh, my thought I just had myself is, what if 
anytime en anybody engages one of them, they let out a big cry, like the chieftain will go, you dare to approach me? And that will let everybody in the server know, hey, something's happening, you, you can now, it kind of acts like a ward does in Baron and gives away that you're going after and gives the other team a chance to respond and stop you. And maybe the, the, the Svenar will just roar, this mighty roar. And you could also use that to fake people out and pretend to go after one of them when really you just have, and you know, one guy, you know, hit him and do, maybe you have to do 10% damage before he lets out that roar. And then everybody just fakes out and goes somewhere else. Like that would be a really interesting I, system. I mean, that, that's, that's, I, I, that's not a bad idea, but I, I mean, I think that part of, I think one of the reasons why Arena might have did that is because it's sort of like the trebuchet in the Battle of Kylo. Do you want to invest someone to sit on the trebuchet or defend the trebuchet so that you can have that little bit of advantage? Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to invest someone from your team to go and always make sure, all right, you know, every couple of minutes you're going to run by the bear, you're going to run by the ogre, and you're going to see if they're attacking it, and you're going to let us know. You know, it's, 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 it gives you, it, it makes you have to make, make a decision of how you want to use your resources on your team. And I think that is the interesting part of the gameplay. Yeah, as Quilp said, it needs to have a risk-reward system. It shouldn't just be, hey, I'm running by him, let me just kill him right now because there's no reason not to, right? Yeah, and yeah. another reason why I brought this up is because right now it's just dying so fast that even if you spot it, like, if you cannot fight it, it's going to go down before anyone can go across the map to help you. Mm. Okay, uh, Freelancer, any final thoughts about the Forest of Niffle Hole map? Uh, it wasn't my favorite map, but it was it was decent. I mean, the, the mob really gives it a League of Legends feel as that extra factor. It's not just you versus the enemy team which is always great. Um, you know, adding more elements of strategy is, is great. I was glad to see there wasn't really any R&D elements there. You know, he wouldn't randomly throw down this huge thing that insta killed people. You know, it was just basically a tank in Spain, which yeah. meant that the other team was just as likely to kill it with an organized group as you are if you both engaged it. Um, I was glad to see that, you know. Um, I still sort of like Battle Kylo better. Uh, but it's uh, it's mainly due to the fact that trebuchets are so much more. Uh, it, it seems like there's so much more tactics involved with the trebuchets. All right, um, let's let's move over to the Battle of Kylo then. What did you like about the trebuchet system? Well, you know, a lot of people are saying that the trebuchet you you have to sacrifice one of your guys to hold it. I was the and everybody loved it on my stream. I was the mesmer. You could place a portal, an entrance portal, in the clock tower and place your exit at will whenever you wanted at the trebuchet. <laughs> so I would go place an entrance portal at the clock tower, go man the trebuchet, and whenever I saw somebody at the clock tower and I saw my buddies there fighting or whatever, I just placed an entrance portal and bore back. How long you know, does no that one down. stay in the and, clock tower? What's the uh, 60 seconds. So I could actually go run over and, and use my blink. I, it only took two blinks to get from the clock tower, jump on these little things that cover uh, the pathway, blink up to the tread because – Blink is so bugged in the game, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you could actually target the edges of walls, which in our case, if you remember the trebuchet sitting on that little mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And it has these little uh, barricades kind of defending it. Well, you could actually blink. You could target those barricades from the other side of the treb and blink up. So I could span the distance between the treb and clock tower even manually in about seven, eight seconds. And that's even without my portal. So what I ended up doing with the, a couple other TL guys just to show that how easy it was, is we were using two Mesmers. It was a dual Mesmer group. We would always have an entrance or an exit at two points. And the second we found out that somebody was taking those points, we'd place an entrance at the clock tower, port to it real quick, mass AOE, kill whoever we can, and then that <laughs> Mesmer would place his entrance and port back. And so we were always at the clock tower, all five guys at the clock tower, and we were able to point to a port to any one of the two points at any time to completely wipe out whoever it was with five guys. And they couldn't do anything to touch us because when we ported there, one of the mesmers would place an entrance, we'd port back. And um, it, it sounds it, to me like they're probably going to have to nerf portals at some oh, point because <laughs> they're so damn useful in world versus world and in structured P versus PvP. Yeah, it was, and you know that's how I think I capped to. It was I was I was amazed. I had like 180 viewers on my stream watching me do this in structured PvP. And uh, they were the best part about it was me as a mesmer, and I don't think any other class could do it just as effectively. Is I, I started each match running to that clock tower, placing an entrance, manually going to the trebuchet, firing, 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 firing. If it ever the clock tower was ever under trouble, I would just port back instantly. 
And that just combo was so effective because then you didn't have to sacrifice one guy on the trebuchet. And uh, it worked really, really well. That's why I like Kylo, just because we had that little strategy well, working. One of the things I didn't like about Kylo, it was more from a mechanical point of view. Uh, the trebuchet itself, um, the time it takes you to kill it compared to the time it takes you to repair the trebuchet is like completely off. Um, probably spend around 40 seconds just beating on a trebuchet for no reason <laughs> to then have it repair instantly just by taking one of the kits. I mean, maybe from a player's standpoint, maybe that feels cool to some, but if I'm spectating in a game and I just, the caster goes to this camera and, hey, this guy's still beating out the trebuchet and then, you know, not a lot of action going on around it, then yeah, I, I don't know. I just didn't like the whole feeling of a styling tool. I, I, I was I was more particular. I like Battle of Kylo better than the uh, the forest, um, mainly because I like the scenery in Kylo. I like the the buildings and the different sort of escape paths that you have in it, and also the destructible uh, clock tower. Um, I thought it was kind of useful to kind of just take out the roof and you could see who's actually in there and how many people they got from a distance. Um, but yeah, I liked, I liked Hilo because there was a lot of times where you, it was, it was fun running away from people, but it was also annoying chasing people. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, as an elementalist, I was much more effective on Kylo because I was, I was specifically, uh, you know, able to break line of sight a lot more often on Kylo. And so I was able to get out when I, you know, if I had been immobilized or, or bursted down, I could get out of the fight with my escape skills because they couldn't target me with their slows or with their stuns or what have you. And so I was able to use my really good mobility skills to get me out of the way because I could break line of sight so often. Often. Whereas on the forest, oftentimes there was not something for me to use to break line of sight. And so they could just chain stun me or chain immobilize me into the ground if I ever got caught. Because I was kind of going with a sort of glass cannon system where if I, like, like Freelancer said, if you get caught, you get caught. And that's all there is to it. And the Elementalist is definitely one of the squishiest classes in the game. Whereas, you know, the Necromancer might be a, a scholar class, but it has a huge health pool. And the Mesmer has, you know, those blinks and a lot of other stuff and, and the clones and stuff that you can use. But the Elementalist really really doesn't have anything except the escape skills, which are really nice, but you can't use if you're immobilized. And it, so uh, the, the thing I didn't like about Kylo, though, and it may, I mean, it's going to go away because as I learn the map more, but it, it, when I first got on, it was really confusing to try and figure out exactly where you were. I mean, it is perfectly mirrored, but because everything is slightly different in terms of how it looks on each side mm -hmm. of the clock tower. It, I, and I, because I was red sometimes and blue other times, sometimes I got really confused as to where I was going and which point I was headed at. I would like that you could see the points through the level though. That helped reorient me and get me going in the right direction. And But compared to the forest level, which was just way more straightforward and easy to understand and pick up like that, Battle of Kylo was definitely harder to fathom, I guess you could say. Yeah, um, another thing now that we're talking about, you know, LOS and this kind of thing is um, there was a lot of issues with the uh, animations interactions for example if I was leaping with my hammer burst kill and you stun me in the middle of the leap it will stun me and then pull me back all the way to the initial point of the leap instead huh. of uh, stopping me wherever you stun me when I was leaping so I don't know if it was because of the servo lag or if that does it's sound like just a lag a artifact, artifact but... whereas maybe they stunned you, but your client didn't know it until you were halfway through the air. Because the client side prediction is probably just going off the fact that if it doesn't hear anything from the server, that whatever you do happens. So you tell the client, I'm doing my leap. And halfway through the leap, it gets a message from the server. And oh, by the way, you got stunned when you were back here, you know, 150 milliseconds ago. And then oh, your, your client has to compensate by, by going backwards. So that may have been exacerbated by the server lag that John Peters was talking about in that post. At least we can hope, <laughs> right? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, so I'm hoping to see a lot of improvements in that, uh, you know, in the optimization and in the server lag thing for the next beta. And I think that's really going to tell us how close and how tight the game is going to be by release by how much improvement we see between this beta and the next one. If we see a lot of improvement, then we can probably assume that it's going to be as tight as we hope it. If it only goes a little bit, well, then we might have to be uh, concerned to see how it, how it actually tightens up for an eSports-style control scheme. Um, so, I guess 
Uh, we don't have too much time. Any final thoughts you guys wanted to make on either Kylo or Forest or just the general uh, the systems in PvP or yeah. how it went? Um, I will say that right now the this was a really disappointing uh, battle weekend for those that were looking forward to uh, competitive play. It definitely, the server State. browser proves it wasn't really finished. They haven't been working on this yeah. above and beyond just getting the balance right. And, and I mean, it, it makes sense that they want to, you know, have world versus world and everything else in a really good shape since it's going to be um, aiming towards a bigger uh, group of people in terms of how many are interested in it. Um, also, I would like to point out that glory, the way you obtain glory, um, is basically all due to personal uh, score inside the game itself. So if you're capturing a, uh, a point, you get this amount of glory, and even if you win the game, you're not gonna get any kind of bonus glory. So I thought that was pretty nice um, somewhat, because it kind of makes you, it lets you know that, hey, if you do this, if you play the game like you're supposed to be playing it, by focusing on the objectives rather than just mass slaughtering people, you're gonna be rewarded for it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much all the thoughts I would like to add. All right, Vega, any final thoughts on structured PvP? Um, I mean, I, I liked it. I know people are saying that they were disappointed by it, but I mean, it's it's a beta. You know, if you, it, you can't think of it as it's gonna be polished to the point where it could be competitive. Um, Freelancer's Hello. phone is trolling us again. <laughs> is your um, phone right next to your webcam by chance? <laughs> Vega yeah, tossed sure. his backwards because he thought it was his. I was like, where's mine? There it goes again. That would explain. You, you probably can't hear it, I assume. Okay, that, that, that explains it then. Yeah, it's definitely going. Uh, but yeah, like, like you said, Vega, it feels to me like there's a lot of potential here. Like I can see where it's going to be great, but it definitely doesn't feel right yet. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, th they have so much stuff that they're working on, they're focusing on, and that, you know, there's plenty of room for improvement. Um, I wouldn't let this weekend kind of deter people from thinking that this has any potential of being an eSport because I think it's def it definitely still does. Um, I mean, there's, def there's, there's so much room to improve, and just what they've shown now, um, I think it has great potential. Freelancer, so. final thoughts. Uh, well, you know, we talk a lot of worldly world and stuff, but Team Legacy also has the structured PvP teams that are taking it uber seriously. And it was disappointing because I popped into their channel to ask them about it and how they were doing this stuff. And when they told me that they couldn't even practice or organize together because of the way that um, the servers were working, it was a little upsetting because we also want to, you know, kick off our tournament. Of course, we got the, uh, the Legacy tournament, which, you know, we're looking at a 5 or 1K prize pool, $500 or 1K. We're not sure yet. We got a few sponsors even, you know, that, that are talking to us about it. And I, I, I'm hesitant to start anything with that because there's no spectator mode. I mean, we, we me and you talked about this, Bridger, eye drops, um, you know, about if we could do anything with this without a spectator mode of how we could get this tournament out to all of the structured PvP guilds out there that want to participate. And, you know, it, hopefully we're the first tournament. We you know we got a 1K prize pool. How exciting is that, right? But if we don't have a spectate mode, how can you possibly cover it, Bridger? You know? Right. So. Yeah. I mean, the the good news is that I did read a post, and I can't remember if it was by John Peters or somebody else on the PvP team, uh, that basically reiterated everything that we had been told before. Like, like I was worried, like, okay, well, it's clear that they haven't really been working on the server browser to implement what they wanted, or at least what we've seen uh, maybe they just put the early version in there because the build that has the new server browser isn't ready yet, what have you. Whatever the case may be, I was worried like, oh, I wonder if they're going to be backing off those original promises. And I read a post in the developer, uh, you know, from one of the developers that basically said, here's the way it's going to work. We're going to have the ability to, for, for, for guilds to own their own server, to put passwords on it, to change the way that it works, to turn on and off auto balance, to change the number of people that are on there. You can join tournaments that are automated, blah, blah, blah. You can set up your own tournaments, whatever. So he basically reiterated all of the things that we're hoping to see. So that means to me, if he's reiterating that those facts are all still true, then they probably are still working on those things behind the scenes. It's just not in this build. 
because like Miane said, they're trying to show off the epic parts of the game to the people, the, to the mass crowds. We all know that the, the, the hardcore people are going to, you know, pay attention before launch. And if this stuff is all put in before launch, they're going to be there. The casual people, the people that are just, you know, that don't follow the game all the time, they are going to see what there is to see now. And they're not going to come back if they don't like it. So it seemed to make sense for them to pay more attention to that and to them. Let's just hope that before the game gets to launch, we see more of uh, the structured PvP yeah. evolving the way we hope it will. And, and it should be noted, I, I completely understand that it's not, it's beta, it's not going to be out yet, but mm -hmm. there's there's a part of every one of us, and I know it's in YouTube, Bridger, that thinks that if if they don't show some progress or, or anything, that this might take five months into launch. Yeah. You know? I'm and then at that, that point, the big question is for everybody in chat, is that too long? You know, is that going to kill the scene? If we have to wait three and five months into the game in order to see any sort of tournament, you know, spectator type tournament scene. And that's what I worry about. I mean, I, of course, it's not going to be there at launch. I've accepted that. Everybody's accepted that. But if if they're going to wait half a year, you know, or or any amount of time, we just don't know. That that's always at the back of my mind because we're putting so much money into it that uh, you know we really want to see the esports scene kick off uh, as far as Team Legacy Net. And uh, it's just it's something for me to think about, and especially all the other structured PvP teams that are organizing right now as we speak. You know. Mm -hmm. they're they're all paying attention to that news they want to see something on that front so i really hope that we see progress in all fronts i hope we see the world versus world bugs that we've talked about sort of get fixed and maybe make it so that uh you know maybe supplies more more important whatever all the things that we talked about uh maybe see the, the the dynamic events we didn't really talk about it but the overflow system was obviously kind of broken you couldn't ever quite quite find your party you know they wouldn't wind up on the same overflow server there was no the queue only ever triggered once for me so hopefully all of those things we see progress before the next beta and a month is actually a really long time when you've got the game in the state that it's in and most of the content is all in there fixing these kinds of things you can see a lot of improvement in a month rather than you know putting brand new content in there tweaking content that already exists that can happen pretty fast so i'm really optimistic that we'll see progress on all fronts for the next beta which may be sometime at the end of may uh if we're lucky maybe a little earlier but uh i guess with that guys I think that's it. It's been a really, really long show. Thanks, everybody, for sticking Indeed. with us. Sorry? Absolutely. Miane trolling me there. <laughs> We've still got 300 people on the stream. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Again, if you're listening to this and you want to send us feedback, feedback at talesoftyria.com is the email address. Tell us, what was your favorite World vs. World experience? Uh, and also, just tell us if we missed anything. I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff. We crammed as much as we could possibly cram into this game, but I'm sure that we missed something. So please let us know. We're looking forward to your emails. Feedback at TalesOfTyria.com. I'm Bridger. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Again. What the hell? <laughs> that would have there it goes. I, I unmuted it and it was just like, <laughs> I don't think that's my phone. I think it is because you're the only one who can't hear it and it's not my phone. I, I see it. It's coming through on your mic when it's going off. Oh, that's off. right. Like... It is coming through on your mic when it's going off. I saw that too. Oh, man. Thanks, everybody. That was a massive show. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the most yeah, to my. Really long. Thanks. Thanks uh, most to my wife for tolerating this bullshit. <laughs> she wants to go to sleep, and we're. I need to get a. We need to get a new place that has a studio I can set up. You know, with all that money I'm raking in. <laughs> oh, man. I was trying to refrain from calling anyone casual, but I, I live. <laughs> all right, I need to go, guys. Thanks everybody for tuning into the stream. 